Alexa. Hello. Nice to see you all in St Albans. Um, it would have been nice to have come up the, uh, the Thames link to come and see you because um, I really enjoy coming to St Albans to visit. The first time I did that was, and I'm trying to remember, Simon probably remembers, uh, 2007 I think it was when I was principal speaker of the Greens and I came up to, um, to co-present a showing of the Al Gore film I think yes there you go um, and it was quite quite a successful fundraiser I think everyone wanted to see that film um, and that was a that was another big wave of interest in in climate issues during that period and Simon's a fantastic counsellor and I'm a huge huge fan uh, and we'll talk more about that later so I've, I've been asked to come and talk to you about uh, a green recovery and there is a big big but that I wish to say before we get to that point which is that we are nowhere near through this crisis yet um, we have um, there's a lot of people and it's not it's not us the greens um, I was I was slightly concerned when that when the crisis first started that that we'd be um, so so pleased with our policies all being the right policies that we we might be be jumping straight to the end when there's so much that still has to go on before we we get to that point um, and the the continued death that we're still seeing the number of people out there who've lost their jobs and their their livelihoods uh, the number of people who've lost family members is ridiculously huge it's above 50,000 people across the country and and that's an enormous tragedy that I'm not sure we're still in shock from as, as a nation and so when it comes to a green recovery we are genuinely talking about planning the things that will get us through the remaining periods of the crisis any second wave that we're all really worried about having and and all the period until we get to actually having um a vaccine or, or a successful treatment for this before we can go yay it's all over um, and, and I really worry about people talking about and it's, I'm not throwing this at you the Greens at all the media are just as bad at this the amount of times they invite us on to the media to talk about when this is all over um, and I just think it really strikes the wrong tone so we are you know we are facing this enormous crisis and it is an absolute crisis for the country that we face that um, but we already had, I mean, we in the Greens are, we are used to this. We were already highlighting massive crises in the world, the ecological crisis and the climate crisis. And in, in London, I talk about the housing crisis an awful lot. We came into this crisis facing multiple crises um, already. And so we, we did as Greens have a very transformative, world changing, building a better world, um, narrative, a, a fantastic set of policies set up to fight these existing crises that we already have. And I think we are therefore better placed than most parties to look ahead into the future and look at how we need to rebuild, because we do, we've, we've, we've faced an enormous uh, tragedy, a lot of destruction has happened, there's, there's a lot of changes happened. And so there's a need to rebuild now that is very similar to the to the ways in which we needed to transform our society and now we have this added imperative we owe it to the people who lost their lives we owe it to the people who've suffered setbacks in their careers um setbacks in their in their families and all those things that have happened to people we owe it to all of that loss to make a better world for us to emerge into as we go through it and you know, the climate deadlines haven't gone away you know, there's no you can't put off the 10 year deadline that we started with of having to get ourselves to climate neutrality by 2030. And now that we have to put investment into rebuilding, there is, I think, no question that we need to put that investment in to a green recovery. So this is the right thing to be talking about now because there are choices being made now that could set us back if we bail out the wrong industries, if we uh, invest in massive road building programs as a knee jerk reaction to the problems with public transport. These are things that we can argue against doing because they will set us back. They won't help us solve the crises we started with. But there are also huge um, policies we can we can put forwards that, that fold everything into the same solution. So I think, you know, get, we, we're all about building resilience in the Green Party and a lot of our policies 
are very resilient to this crisis. They were right before, they're right things to get us through it, and they're the right things for afterwards. And the absolute classic policy for that is universal basic income. You'll have all seen how suddenly there's a the, the polling on, on universal basic income as a as a thing that people for, for one thing, don't say don't know to when asked if they support it by polling companies. But there's actually a majority of people now who say, yes, I support this, um, which is incredible change compared with um, previous polling on this, where most people would go, oh, I don't know, or mm, I'm very sceptical of that, or um, that's not the welfare system I'm used to. Now people are thinking, actually, yes, we cannot afford to have people slipping through the cracks. We've seen that in a crisis situation, but it is the right thing for when we're not in a crisis as well it's how society is resilient and so there are there are some really really big things we can put into our plans for a green recovery that that are things that were already in our um or already in our manifesto and that might not be quite as obvious as green things as well like universal basic income and then as a party we've also done an awful lot of the groundwork towards the idea of of making massive investments and transforming the world that is essentially all of what I talked about during the general election. Those of you who were parliamentary candidates will have um, hopefully been really, really pleased as I was to be able to stand up in a, in a general election situation and present a costed plan that involved investing colossal amounts of money in making colossal changes to how we do things. And I think, you know, during that general election, we did a, an excellent job of, of mainstreaming that kind of investment, the, the Green New Deal, but the Green New Deal at the scale we were talking about stood the test of the scrutiny of a general election. There's a, there's a really good BBC fact check piece where they go, 100 billion pounds a year? Really? That seems like quite a lot. Let's fact check that. And by the end of it, they're going, yeah, actually, that totally works. And we can, to we can spend that money and it won't cost us that much and it will transform the world. And I was really, really proud for us to, to have brought that to the attention. There's the really um, amazing uh, quote uh, clip from Jimmy Carr, and I can't remember which programme it was on, but it was on one of the um, sort of late night politics discussion programmes. And Jimmy Carr is not a Green, but nevertheless, he said in, you know, in the middle of that election, he said, the Greens have been amazing. You know, they've, they've really talked about transforming the world. And when you look at what they say, it really makes sense. They're the party that's going to be not just, you know, still there in 10 years, it's going to be still there in 50 years. And, and, and that is a, you know, that's a real testament to us bringing some of these, these issues into the mainstream in, in the very, very competitive atmosphere of a general election. So I think we have this, this chance now to tie a lot of things together to show that our policies are the compassionate resilient ones that will help see us through this crisis but also um, see us through to a better world at, at the end of it that leaves us in a better place now um, in terms of your reading material uh, we're, we're working on so many things at a national level uh, molly scott cato who's our economics um I was going to say correspondent then, our economic spokesperson, Molly Scott Cato, um, is working on some, some plans very similar to what we put forward in the general election, which are to do with how we, we raise money, what we tax and, and how we invest. Um, and that's absolutely fantastic. Caroline Lucas has been doing, uh, I'm going to wave a printout at you, uh, a campaign called Green Steps to Better. And there she's been taking work she's been doing with the Green New Deal group um, and looking specifically at five steps that we take as we as we go through the crisis of things that will help during and afterwards as well and step one of that is called rescue people and the planet not climate climate criminals and that is all about who gets the bailouts um, and then we've got um, excellent proposals about food because obviously um, we, we worry about medicine supply and all of those kinds of things and these are again these are quite similar things to when we were thinking about uh, no deal Brexit and our preparation for that and the kinds of resilience we needed to build in our communities. But food is another very important aspect of that. That it's also about decarbonisation. There's um, a clean, affordable green energy. Um, if we're choosing what to invest in now, we have to be doing that to make sure that we're not dependent on imports from around the world, um, as well as making sure that we decarbonise our, our daily lives. And then there's the question of safe and affordable housing for all. And I work in housing and, and the, the, the way we've 
fully accepted the human right to a secure home in the context of a deadly disease is to me a very big step forwards. I gave a talk to the Young Greens a few weeks ago where I talked very um, in lots of detail about this, this human right to housing, which we've now recognised by bringing the homeless people into hotel accommodation. And the next few weeks are a really crunch time for maintaining that right and investing in changing in how we provide housing. And then Caroline's fifth and sixth steps are a basic income for all. Absolutely, how much that would have seen us through this crisis and how much it is the basis for a very uncertain future where we're not sure which industries are going to be succeeding and which are going to be failing. We have to make sure that throughout this there's a safety net for absolutely everybody. And then safer streets and cleaner air. You know, we overnight got cleaner air and safer streets due to the travel restrictions. And now we have to guard against going back to air pollution, going back to everybody in cars. And we have that big transport question, which I'll, I will I'll keep trailing, but I'll come back to um, later on as well. But our challenge in the next steps, as well as arguing for these positive policies, is to fight against a new austerity narrative, because that's what we lost last time. Um, like I said, in 2007, there was a huge upswell of of concern about the environment. The, the, the polling on the environment was so high. We were getting very, very excited in Green Party HQ because when you poll people about what are the most important issues facing the world, um, people, so there's, a, there's a polling company that does this. It asks people um, without giving them categories to choose from to name the most important issues that facing the world. And then they classify them into categories afterwards. So it's a very much a free choice for people to say what's on their mind. It's a very telling poll. And the environment is often very low in those polls. People are much more concerned about much more short term things. But during uh, 1989, which was our big, our big surge, uh, our first one, it got up to the top issue for a short while. And in 27, 2007, it did the same. There was climate camp. There was this film by Al Gore. There were, there were other um, types of activism going on. I was part of a movement against big four by fours and for cleaner transport. And for a short while in 2007, we had the top issue um, in that poll. Uh, and then we had the banking crisis. Then we had the austerity narrative taking over and the the narrative from government was there's no money for this stuff anymore you're going to have to wait and the the concern about the environment dropped and dropped and dropped um after that and, and we cannot afford to let that happen again we can't afford to to let social justice be forgotten we can't afford to go back to squeezing welfare recipients and letting people um go in letting millions and millions of people live in absolute poverty and we can't afford to miss our climate deadlines. So, so that is our job because that narrative is already starting. But thank you, thanks to you know the, the groundwork that we've done. Thanks to thanks to lots of things like direct action from Extinction Rebellion. Thanks to you know Caroline Lucas's just really fierce and immediate work going to talk about green recovery and, and green investment right there in the heart of things. Um, we have the public with us at the moment. We really, really do. The New Economics Foundation, no, sorry, it was Neon, sorry, who were an offshoot of NEF, um, did some polling on issues to see what people thought. That's where that question about universal basic income comes from. But when they're polling about how we recover from this and, and things that we do and what's, what are the most important issues, the environment is still right up there. Um, people are getting this, finally. So even in a crisis situation, even when there's the threat of the austerity narrative, people are still saying we must invest. And, and that's really fantastic. And our, and our party polling, again, we normally see our party getting squeezed, particularly outside of election time as well, when we're not, current, we're not on the TV as much because there's no balance rules. Um, we often see our polling drop and drop and drop. But actually our polling in national opinion polls, the polling in London just before the election was cancelled, sadly, um, was was holding up really, really well. In fact, it was, you know, it's, it's, it's higher. It was on a on an upward tra trajectory, which is which is very, very unusual um, and, and very, very good. So, yes, we have to we have to work on, on this. We have to work to make sure that, that the world we come out into is better, that there's there's more justice. There's less inequality at the end of things, that the climate and the investment in the Green New Deal is still there. And, and absolutely none of these things are a given.
we, we can look back just 10 years and see how we lost this battle before. Um, so this is a very, very important job we all have at the moment. Um, I think at the top where, you know, the, the, the top of politics within councils, the decision makers, what we really need is more cooperation in politics. I think we need, um, I said the other week that we, the other week from last three days ago, um, that we need a united opposition um, because I think the, the Conservatives are so poor and there is still this, this binary of, of the Conservatives versus Labour and it isn't good enough that Keir Starmer is trying to be the opposition all on his own and become the next Corbyn who everybody loves. That's not mature politics. We do need all the parties who are in opposition to be working together and putting a united voice forwards and a coherent case and one that, that can demonstrate that it has wide public support and isn't tribal and isn't really about politics. I think this is genuinely a moment for that kind of politics to come forwards. It means really mature leadership. Um, and I just want to chuck out the, the, the Jacinda Ardern point here at this point, um, because she is universally regarded as one of the best leaders in the world at the moment, but she is not the leader of a, a single party government. She, her party has the Greens and another party whose name all I always forget in the government with her. There are Green cabinet members making decisions um, that she is the, the figurehead for, but it isn't just her. I, mean, I know New Zealand's a small country, but the government of New Zealand is not just her. It is a cooperative government of parties that are mature. They work under a PR system that are used to working together and do the kind of leadership that, and it leads to the kind of leadership that we need here. Now, Jonathan talked about this on the telly today, and he said this could be um, our final hour or our finest hour. And that's good leadership there from Jonathan. That's a cracking phrase to check out there. But I think it is, it is definitely about having the right kind of leadership. But I think it is also about um, working in our local communities, the, the work that's been done during the crisis to, to genuinely on a street by street, neighborhood by neighborhood level, help and support and look out for each other and show solidarity with everybody in the, the local area um, to offer unjudgmental support in the recognition that anybody could be vulnerable or isolated or suffering during this crisis has been the real beginnings of something amazing at a local level as well and i genuinely think that if we're going to win this this battle of public opinion it can't only be done in an atomized way sitting on social media or from the top no matter how good the leadership is i think it has to be about building further on those networks of local cooperation um having face-to-face -face conversations as much as you can but but one-to-one -one conversations and discussions in small groups in local areas and taking that action locally um, and making sure that that you're supporting each other and building power bases that are that are local i think there's and again going back to the green party i think we've never been in better shape to be part of that to be leaders in that cooperative way that i talked about within that kind of movement we are now running more councils than than we ever have we're in we're in the administration now in 18 councils um, and in none of them are we doing it on our own. We are in cooperation with other parties. And I think even when we're in opposition, so me and Simon are both sole councillors <laughs> in our local council areas. And I think, you know, we, we can be that, that catalyst, even if there's one of us, we can be the ones who say, look, Lib Dems and Labour, um, we need to sit down together and, and work on some of these issues together. And I think because we're saying it, that can make those parties that might not like each other too much come together a bit more I think we can genuinely show that kind of leadership um, so one of the questions I was asked um, so then go back to the questions that I was asked to, to, to tackle one of them was about um, what's the intersection between race issues and climate issues and how the, the British environmental movement needs to change in order that we, we can become less of a white movement and I think this crisis, as well as the crisis in America, has really, really shown up that intersection between um, the racial justice and the social justice and the global justice and the climate justice issues that, that we really, really face um, at the moment. And I think there's been 
a, a just a, a turning point where nobody can ignore race issues or say it's not a problem or deny discrimination in the way that they used to be able to do. Uh, one example, and from, from my work within housing, there's an amazing um, article written um, by um, the people at Inside Housing magazine, um, which is a sort of trade publication that you normally have to pay to read. Um, but they've done an extraordinary job of putting these things out for, for non-subscribed users to have a look at. And they have some, some great work looking at the intersection between um, housing deprivation, the overcrowding, the number of people living in houses of multiple occupation, the numbers of people living in temporary accommodation in local areas compared with the infection and death rate during the coronavirus crisis so far. And it's a really strong correlation right across the board. And there's a really strong correlation too between um, the, the occupation that you're in and the um the rate of infection and we've seen that too and then there's also on top of that a genuine um what seems to be somewhat of a genetic susceptibility to coronavirus crisis and extra vulnerability for people in certain uh, bme groups um so all of those factors the 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 housing the deprivation the types of occupations people are in the race the class the social issues they all absolutely pile up to make an incredible amount of racial injustice, the, the amount of BME people who are affected by coronavirus and by the issues that, that are affected around coronavirus, like losing their jobs, is absolutely huge. And combined with an upsurge in actual overt racism and discrimination, there's a, there's a proper crisis point that we can't shy away from tackling. And I think as a party, we are doing better than we have before on this. We've got the, the Greens of Colour group, um, who've existed for a little while, but they have reinvigorated their committee and their campaigning and their work and their their voice within the party and the amount of interaction there is between the leadership and the, the central party and the, the Greens of Colour group is higher than it's ever been before. There's a lot of dialogue going on, there's a lot of campaigning, um, there's you know demands, there's visibility of our BME councillors and our um, and the group itself has got an amazing Twitter feed, which you need to to follow. Where they're, they're making these connections and putting out good good messages, and I think we we are better equipped than we have been before to change that stereotype of us as a purely white middle class party and start to attract more people of colour into the party, knowing that they, they have a place within the party, a place that's respected and opportunities within the party. And if you are a person of colour, I want to encourage you to stand for the posts on GPEX, to get involved with Greens of Colour, get on their committee and stand for local council as well, because we absolutely need to, to be pushing more of our uh, members into, into the light, but also internally making sure that we listen as well. And that I think is something we've We've started to do much better. We've built up the structures of how we can listen and involve and engage different groups. And we're doing the same thing with the Young Greens as well. They're much more involved. And I think we'll, we'll be a more diverse party and we'll be much clearer in our messages and our the way we send out invitations to, to people to come and join us will seem like a more um, inviting place and a, and a home for more people in that way. So I'm, I'm really happy to take more questions on that um from the people who put the questions if i didn't tackle that well enough and then finally oh my god transport so transport's one of the most difficult issues um that we we have to face in terms of how we get through the crisis and then what happens afterwards because of the fact that we have a problem with how many people we can currently fit onto public transport so when you're talking about places um smaller towns um, or places where people live and work in the same area. We are talking about how to organise things on a borough level. It's it's quite simple to take those short journeys and push them onto walking and cycling by massively improving the sort of facilities for walking and cycling. And that's what we're investing in in London. That's what the government's for once decided to put some money into um, for local areas. And and the question I've got here is that if you were to scrap HS2, how would you spend the money saved? We made a proposal for this um, in the uh, run up to the general election, which was essentially take the money we would have spent on HS2 and give it to all the local areas to spend on walking inside. So the money the government's just put to local areas, we would have t multiplied that by 10 and given it to local areas to invest in the stuff that they've just started to put money into. So yeah, there, there needs to be serious investment in not only temporary um, 
infrastructure for walking and cycling, but turning that then continued investment in order that we can turn that into to proper concrete and, and new curbs in the right places, not just bollards. Um, that's really, really important. But how we organise work so that people who were previously doing what London, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm running for London Mayor, and I know how many people commute from just outside London into London on public transport, on journeys that cannot be walked and cycled. And so I think we do have to, and I write about this in my local paper, the Camden New Journal, go read it. Um, I do think we genuinely need to think about how we organise workplaces where people are currently commuting to a very, very central place and, and how we actually structure the town planning um, and whether or not we need to make sure that the banks that were very centrally put into glass towers of thousands and thousands of desks now have to make satellite offices for the places that, that are where their people are much, much closer to where their people live and whether or not homeworking is the right answer for most people I don't know because I know that I mean I'm here in homeworking in one room I haven't got a big flat some of my colleagues are, are in much smaller rooms my at least my room is big and a flat's worth of room a lot of people are working um, with me and for me who are in a, a, a bedroom that's that's in a shared house and that's their space where they live and where they work and and we do need to be thinking about how to make offices that are places where people can be socially distant and yet not in their homes and there's a lot of rethinking to be done and I don't know what the answer to that currently is because what we can't do is suddenly just put everybody into their cars um, because that doesn't work either the, the millions of cars that would have to pour down the motorways into London literally cannot fit into our city so that's still up for debate and for the time being it's 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 the answer we have at the moment, which is which is ask people to work at home, but that isn't in the end just, and it isn't actually a long-term way for people to work. So yeah, there are there are some very very big challenges to 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 answer. So hopefully that's that's helped to answer people's answer questions on that. And then the question of how to get people to consume fewer resources is really interesting because there's been a real upsurge of interest during the crisis in people trying to get things mended and one of the the sections of the of the manifesto that i put together um for london which is sadly unpublished and 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 not signed off by the committee by quite as well at the time but one of the sections of that manifesto was all about reducing the stuff turnover of our economy and how to create more jobs create more locally based services um create revived town centers built around repairing and recycling and reusing things that we already created that, that don't then need to be dug out of the ground and manufactured and transported right across the world. Um, and so there are answers to be found in that, but it's quite another very big transformation of society that I don't think on that score we've quite won the argument for yet. So yeah, that we haven't we haven't experienced shortages of things yet as part of this crisis and that's a very good thing um but i think long term people thinking they're suddenly going to be able to go back to to previous habits of, of buying everything new are, are already thinking actually i you know i did get that thing repaired and maybe that is the answer for more things in the future so yeah we will see